customer service done right can be your company's single biggest competitive advantage. Welcome to the customer service revolution. Join customer service authority and best-selling author John DeJulius as he interviews leaders who are revolutionizing their industries. This is more than a podcast, though. It's a movement. The customer service revolution is a radical overthrow of conventional business mentality designed to transform what customers and employees experience. If you are a revolutionary customer service leader who's ready to stop competing on price and obsessed with building a brand that people cannot live without, this podcast is for you. What separates world-class customer service companies from everyone else? One significant factor is having someone dedicated to designing and managing the customer's experience. The Customer Experience Executive Academy trains leaders to excel at this. Find out how to enroll now. Contact Claudia at the DeJuliusGroup.com for details. Welcome, revolutionaries, to episode 145 of the Customer Service Revolution. I am John DeJulius, Chief Revolution Officer of the DeJulius Group. Today, my guest is Lisa Ludoff Perlo, former CEO of Celebrity Cruise Line. Lisa went from an entry-level position selling cruises door-to-door to travel agencies in New England and then found herself running a multi-billion dollar global company. I had the pleasure of working, consulting with Celebrity Cruise Line during Lisa's tenure, and she was one of the most amazing, inspiring CEOs and broke the glass ceiling. Um, Lisa's new book, Making Waves, A Woman's Rise to the Top Using Smarts, Heart, and Courage, has just come out and is already a bestseller. Before we get to our interview with Lisa, let's talk about which is a better investment, advertising or customer experience training. So one of the things leaders love to review and look at is revenue streams, right? Your total sales and then how they're broken down, right? And they're, you know, my business, uh, you know, they're broken down by, you know, X percent goes to consulting, um, X percent is keynotes, X percent is book orders, product sales, uh, X percent is our academies, so on and so forth. Every company has revenue streams and different industries have different revenue streams. But the one thing we all have in common, regardless of our revenue streams, regardless of our industry, is that 100% of our sales comes from one place, customers, right? So that's indisputable. And everything we all do as leaders, CEOs, multiple times a year as we review the P&L and we look at where we can reduce expenses. But what we forget that is not in the P&L is hidden right? Is your biggest expense is dissatisfied customers. How? Where's it hidden in the P&L? Well, it's loss of sales. It is a uh, lack of referrals that we have to discount, you know, in order to sell our, our time or sell our products, um, our brand reputation, return and, and refunds, low employee morale, because if we have all those things, they're getting beat up and they're not making the money they typically can make on commissions, tips, whatever your business model is. Time spent on service recovery, higher employee turnover, right? Higher customer turnover, more training because we have higher employee and turnover, which leads to more hiring, more training, spend more on advertising. And we know our clients, customers, guests less because we have new employees that, you know, haven't been there for long enough. So, Most companies battle with the budget dollars over marketing and advertising versus customer experience training. So, you know, take a guess at what you think the global annual budget is spent on each advertising versus customer experience training and whether it's a a percentage. Just think about the percentage. Do you think it's 50-50? 
60-40, 80-20, advertising versus customer experience training? Well, the answer is, from a number dollar standpoint, over $500 billion in 2019 was spent on advertising while $9 billion was spent on customer experience training. Pretty sure that's 98, 99% to one or 2%. So you can see the disparity, but let's look at, you know, what, what is better, right? Advertising or customer experience training. Uh, 75% of customers don't accept advertising as truth. 90% believe brand recommendations from friends. Repeat customers spend more than new. I guarantee you, you could check this out in your business, unless you have one of those businesses that kind of doesn't have repeat customers, like a funeral home, like uh, LASIK eye surgery. Uh, those types of industries don't have repeat customers. They more or less have alumni referrals. Repeat customers refer more than new customers. Track this. You'll be shocked. Repeat customers negotiate less than new customers do. And, you know, it's a fact that in most businesses, one repeat customer is worth five new customers. You have to get five new customers to do what one, keeping one repeat customers. Now, I love new customers, but... If we focus on making our existing customers happy, they'll produce more than any advertising can ever do. Now, think about your sales, okay? Depending on your business, if you have to go out and, and, and acquire a new business, there's basically three types of, of leads, okay? Cold, warm, and hot, so where does cold? Cold means you're reaching out to them. You're cold calling them. You're saying, hey, do you want to buy, right? Uh, warm is advertising. They see your ad, they type in uh, maybe SEO, however you're, you're getting your name in front of them, and they're calling you. That's a warm lead. That's a good thing. Hot, a hot lead is repeat or referral, Okay. And that's someone calling you saying, I've done business with you before. I want to do business with you again. Or so-and-so told me, demanded that I use you. He, he or she heard that I was looking for, and they said, you're it. Okay, so cold, warm, hot. Let's talk about price sensitivity. If it's cold and you're reaching out to them, they didn't even know they needed you. So it's kind of unrealistic. It better blow their mind and be unbelievable, okay? Warm, that comes through advertising that they're calling you, it better be the best deal that they are getting because typically through advertising, if they're, they're searching for someone in your industry, SEO, whatever, uh, the yellow pages, if you remember that, right? They're calling four or five companies in your industry and you're gonna have to you know really stand out and sometimes the only way to stand out to these customers is offering the, the best deal, which is typically the lowest price. Now, a hot, a hot, meaning they're coming back to you because you, you, they've loved working with you and they need you again, or someone told them, if you want the person, the brand for this, there's no one else but you yeah, that they're calling. Their price sensitivity is almost they don't care. They're reaching out to you. They're asking you on the date. They want you. And then you think about the sales cycle is going to be really long if you can close them. And the close rate on cold is a long shot. The close cycle, sales cycle on a warm is, is, uh, you know, going to be, you know, less than a cold, but the close, uh, ratio, uh, rate on them is going to be medium. And on a hot, the sales cycle is, you know, really short because they're calling you. They want you. They know you're it. Let's go. Let's get started. And the close rate is high. So just think about the investment of time of your salespeople and, you know, how do you get them the hot leads versus the warm versus the cold? 5%, a 5% increase in customer retention can increase your company's profits by over 75%. A 5% increase in customer retention can increase your company's profit by over 75%. And 80% 
of a, a company's future revenue will come from just 20% of their existing customers, okay? And then let's look at, you know, world-class brands, okay? Tesla, not only the most valued car maker in the world, but, you know, at times, one of the most valuable companies in the world, um, how they compare to advertising uh, in their in their competition. Elon Musk has tweeted, I hate advertising. And then if you look at Tesla's advertising versus their competitors, you know, average spend by GM a year annual is uh, over three billion dollars. Ford is almost two point five billion dollars in advertising, and then you got you know Fiat, Toyota, Honda, BMW are you know they go from half a billion to almost two two billion there, and then Tesla zero zero spent in advertising yet. They're the number one car valued company in the world and sometimes the number one valued company in any industry. Another thing we got to be careful is don't penalize brand loyalty, meaning, you know, you see all these, you know, switch and save and new customers get. But what about your existing customers? You know, we're only focused on giving perks to new customers, but we're not remembering to reward our loyal customers. So my question to you is, what would happen if we reverse the spending on marketing and advertising versus the investment spending on customer experience? Let's see what the late Tony Shea says about Zappos' philosophy on advertising. The philosophy is let's take most of the money that we would have spent on paid advertising or paid marketing and rather spend it on that invest it into customer service and the customer experience, and then let our customers do the marketing for us. And let's hear from what Howard Schultz, former CEO and president of Starbucks, said what was critical to building Starbucks. But I believe very strongly that we could build a different kind of company. I never believed, never, I think it would have been arrogant to believe, that we could have 1,000, 2,000, or 7,500 stores in the US and around the world. But something really magical started happening. And it started happening as a result of not advertising or conventional consumer classical marketing. The fact is that Starbucks spends very little on traditional advertising. It started happening because we demonstrated to ourselves and now the world that to build an enduring, sustainable, long-term business and consumer brand, it's not about fancy marketing. It's about establishing a very powerful and unusual emotional relationship with the customer. We will be right back after this with our interview with Lisa Ludolf Perlow. Welcome back, revolutionaries. Let's get to today's interview. Today's guest is someone I have huge admiration for, Lisa Ludoff Perlow, Vice Chairman of External Affairs for the Royal Caribbean Group and former CEO of Celebrity Cruises. Lisa went from an entry-level sales position selling door-to-door to to travel agencies in New England and then found herself running a multi-billion dollar global company. I had the pleasure of working with Lisa several years ago, helping her realize one of her key visions of making Celebrity Cruises a world-class customer and employee experience. I got to see her amazing leadership in action and the impact she had on so many. Lisa's new book, Making Waves, A Woman's Rise to the Top Using Smarts, Heart, and Courage has just come out and no surprise, it is already a bestseller. Welcome, Lisa. Oh, John, wow, what an introduction. Thank you. Wonderful to be with you uh, again, my friend. It's been too long. Yeah. And this book, uh, I'm so glad you did it. It couldn't be more timely with your story. You're such an inspiration to so many, not only women, just to so many. So let's jump into it. Why'd you write the book? Well, you know, I think back on my career and I talk a lot about this in the book is I never thought I would end up where I ended up. And I will say that about the book. I never thought I would end up being a published author. It was never in my plan 
it was never my intention, but as I talked to so many people throughout my journey, especially the last nine years of my journey as president and CEO of Celebrity, when they asked me about it, when they asked me all the things that I had done to get there, when they asked about all my experiences and if I could share those so they could maybe learn something at the end, everybody would say, you need to write a book. And finally, people said it to me enough that the team that I worked with at the time said, LLP, you need to write a book. So they finally convinced me that I should write a book, but it was uh, six years in the making. You know, we had a little COVID thing interrupt it, but now it's finally out and I'm really excited about it. And I hope everyone enjoys it because the reason I wrote it was to give back and to help people. You know, my story is if I can do it, you can do it. This is what I learned along the way. And I hope on whatever journey people are on, they might take one, two, or many lessons and be able to accomplish their own dreams. No, it's an ATM of motivation and, you know, just great stories. And so, you know, I love it. How does someone, how did you start at the bottom and get to CEO, which I believe, Lisa, correct me, you are the highest ranking female corporate executive, at least the cruise line industry. Am I correct? Yes. And I was the first woman in the C-suite of our company. I was the first woman to run one of the brands in our company. But when I took on that role, it was actually the third time I was the first woman in our company to run different divisions of our company. On the operations side of our business, I I spent my first 21 years in our company for a total of 39. The first 21 years were spent in sales and marketing. And of course, there are a lot of women in sales and marketing, not only in our company, but across the industry. But there aren't a lot of women running operational divisions in our industry. There were none in our company. And uh, there weren't any women CEOs of brands within our industry either. So in 2014, when I was appointed to this role, it was a big deal. And it got a lot of attention from a lot of different people, mostly related to my gender, which I didn't think about at all because I knew I just worked hard for 30 years and got the position. I finally got the position I deserved. But because I was a woman, it was a big deal. And I, uh, to a lot of different people internally and externally, and I decided to do good with it and pay back and help other women accomplish things in our part of the business where women had really not been before. And how did I do it? I know that was your original question, John. You know, I did it through, I didn't have a plan. And that's one of the chapters in my book. I think it's chapter four. Not everyone has a plan. Now, I didn't come into this company or this role as a salesperson calling on travel agencies door to door, trying to sell cruises to them. I didn't at that time think, okay, and someday I'm going to be president and CEO. Because first of all, it was only one brand in our company. And second of all, I never thought I would end up there. But as my career progressed, as I progressed, as I took on different roles and responsibilities in the company, the first inkling I had that I wanted to do more was when I left sales in 2001 and went into marketing. And a a gentleman that I worked with at the time was the one who moved me from sales and marketing. And what I say in the book is sometimes people think you're capable of more than even you think you're capable of. And he at that time moved me kicking and screaming from sales and marketing because I really only, I was a salesman, you know, that's, that's my thing. Right, right. But that was the first of many moves that ended up leading me to this role. But I didn't decide I wanted to be president and CEO until I think it was probably 2010, I want to say when I thought this was something I wanted to do. I was running celebrity hotel operations at the time. I had an executive coach and he asked me if this was one of the roles that I would like to strive for so that we could put a plan together for me to get there. And that's a story in my book as well. I said I wasn't sure. And he said, the only way you can change the conversation is to have a seat at the table. And so I decided at that point in time, I wanted a seat at the table. And then I... I worked over the next few years to get there. What were you doing, though, early on in your career that got you noticed and promoted? And like, I love what you said. I always say that early on in my career, I did things not that I thought was possible. I didn't have the heart to let people down that thought I could do it. Right. And I ended up doing it. Right. So it's a similar thing. But what were you doing? What was unique about young Lisa that was making noise and getting her promoted over others? 
I've always had a strong sense of drive. I've always been focused on results. Ever since I was a little girl, people used to ask me, when did you know you were a leader? And I said, when I was two years old, because, you know, my first sister was born when I was two years old. And I just thought I was the boss from that very moment. And I was leading the family. That was my role. I took it on willingly and happily. They weren't so happy about it, my sisters, because they were sick of me telling them what to do. But that was just the sort of the role I took on in the family. And then as I got into school, I was in Catholic school and I always wanted to get A's and I always wanted to be the top achiever and the top performer. And when the nuns used to leave the classroom, they said, Lisa, watch the class or Lisa, teach them math or Lisa, help them with their cursive. Palmer method of penmanship. And again, it didn't make me so popular with my classmates, but it was always just something I really loved. And I guess it just followed me, John, throughout my whole career. I I wanted to do well. I wanted to be recognized. I wanted to be the best. I wanted to achieve more than anybody else. Now, granted, it was always within the environment of sales, and that changed as I, I got more experience and I matured as a professional and learned more about the company. But It was just always this inner drive and this inner ambition and maybe a little bit of competitiveness that was at the heart of what got me to where I ended up being. And I'm always someone who says, if somebody doesn't think I can do it, it just motivates me to make sure that I do, you know, that I do accomplish that. I'm a, I'm, you know, another chapter in my book is watch me prove you wrong. Yeah. And so I've spent a lot of my life and career proving people wrong. Yeah. And so what advice would you give young people, but let's lean towards young women who, you know, you could, maybe you can just say, all right, that's the way it is. And I can't do anything about it. What's the best advice to break status quos like, like the glass ceiling? Well, I think it takes a lot of perseverance and self-confidence. And I think that all of us run into a lot of obstacles along our way. I won't say it's only women, but a lot of times it is women just because they might lack the opportunity. There might be fewer of us than there should be in in different places. All the research shows women are reluctant to put themselves forward for positions unless they feel they're 100% ready. And I don't care what position you're going into, you're never 100% ready. I have taken on so many roles in my career where I would think to myself, I must be crazy to do this. I've never done this before. I don't know this. I've never run operations. I've never worked on a ship. I've never driven a ship. I've never been a chief engineer and worked in the engine room. But Subject matter expertise was not the thing that that I was afraid of. I believe that many of us are selected or have attributes that are more important than subject matter expertise. And I believe you can compensate for some of the things you don't know by surrounding yourself with really smart and good people who are subject matter experts who are going to help you be successful because they're going to help you be successful in that way. But you're going to help them be successful in all of the qualities that you bring to something that they probably don't have. And I I just think it's this symbiotic, collaborative style of leadership. And if you're willing to take a chance and do something you've never done before and say, yes, I can. And you have enough confidence to do that, and you're smart enough to surround yourself with the right people, you can accomplish anything. Yeah. And uh, you talk about failure and, you know, how important is that? Because if we're afraid to fail, we will never take those leaps and we don't know what we can accomplish and prove and demonstrate that we belong in that room or in that position. Yeah. And I, you know, I talk about my epic fail in the book. And I think that goes right back to surrounding yourself with really good, strong people who are mutually invested in your success and who know more than you do and are going to make sure that you don't fail. Because when you take on things that you haven't done before, that's even more critically important because sometimes you don't know the questions to ask. You don't know what you don't know. And unless you have someone who has your back, you're going to fail. And I experienced that. And it taught me a lot as a leader to make sure that that never happened again. Not that you're never going to fail again. I I do believe our careers are made up of multiple failures, some big, some small along the way. But to your point, if you're not failing, you're not trying and you're not growing and you're not advancing and you're not being innovative. So that comes with the territory. But it's really who you surround yourself with that, number one, are going to help you overcome the failure faster. And number two, prevent failing in the first place. 
And so that's a core lesson in leadership where you need to know what you don't know, but you need to also make sure the people that you're surrounding yourself do know that and are going to help in your success and be invested in your success. Something that took me a long time to learn as a leader, and I, I certainly saw you do it well, is that as a leader, we don't have to know all the answers, right? And we don't have to be the first one to speak and the first one, you know, and I, I think that's something you, you talk about and you modeled uh, very well is it's okay to ask questions of, of, like you said, the people you surround yourself with and of the people you're dealing with. I've worked with a lot of people throughout the years and not even just in our company, just in general, when you're in different rooms with people, you know that better than anyone, right? You're in a lot of companies with a lot of different leaders and some leaders believe they need to be the smartest person in the room and they, they gain their power through that. They think that that is a sign of strength. And I actually think it's a sign of weakness because yeah. you can't know everything. And to think you're going to know everything is is disempowering even to the people, even to your leaders. They like to know that they know more than you do in some ways. Yeah. And if you think you're the smartest person in the room, you're usually not. And I believe that the value that I bring isn't because I know someone's job better than they do. It's that I'm, I know how to lead people. I know how to create a vision and a strategy and get people to come along on that journey with me and that I respect their experience and their expertise. And in return, I gain their, their respect for my experience and expertise. And again, it goes back to that symbiotic relationship that I think leaders need to have with the people that they work with every day. Yeah. And, and, you know, something else I've learned trial and error is um, even if I if I want my team, my leaders to you know give me their honest opinion. But if I speak first and say, listen, we have three choices here, A, B and C. I really want to know what you guys think, you know, and then I give my opinion. I'm thinking B, you know, makes the most sense to me. And here's why. And then everyone's just going to get on board with B and B might not have been. And, you know, I could have given my opinion last and my opinion might not have been B after I heard everyone else's opinion, but you're steering it and subconsciously manipulating it. And, and, and that's not, you know, what you mean to do. But yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that. What, you know, so, let, you know, let's go to your, your epic failure. What was one of your biggest that you, you discuss in the book and how'd you overcome it? Well, like it was starting up a, a new brand when I was the head of operations for Celebrity and I was brand new in my hotel in my head of operations role. And uh, we, we took on this challenge of starting up this new brand while I was still learning how to be the head of operations for the brand that I worked for. And I was working with a team of people at the time that I thought were professionals in the roles that they had in the operation because it's a very operationally focused thing that you need to do when you start up a new brand. You need to completely renovate the ship. You need to check in all the guests. You need to set up all the technology, all the systems. The ship has to be ready. All the work has to be done. All the experiences have to be ready. The chefs have to be ready. The equipment needs to be working. The rooms need to be made. The deliveries need to happen. And none of that happened. You know, as as I say, in chapter four, anything that could go wrong did go wrong. It was terrible. We weren't ready for our guests. Our travel partners were not happy. The press wasn't happy. Our guests weren't happy. And what I learned at that moment in time, the day we were welcoming guests, was that there was nothing I could do about the situation we were in because, you know, we were in it. It was just, right. it happened. You know, I learned along that, I learned along the way, I probably should have realized sooner and maybe canceled some sailings and, but I didn't, I was, I was where I was, the team, we were all where we were. And what I learned during that time is the worst in people comes out in the worst in times and the best in people comes out in the worst of times. And I remember when it was opening day and we weren't ready to open, but we were there welcoming guests that. Pretty much every other person that was on the ship to help from shoreside left. They all walked off the ship. They had to leave for different reasons. They all went home. And I was left with a core group of shoreside people that I was working with at the time and some people that came from other ships to help out. And it was just me and them. And I just remember looking at them all and saying, we're in kind of a mess. And But I'm not leaving until we fix it. And I remember staying with them for seven weeks 
until we finally got into a situation where it was good enough that we were, you know, stabilized and we were going to just continue to improve from there. I also remember realizing that there were some really talented, smart people on the team that I didn't recognize before that because I didn't have enough exposure to them or I didn't wasn't didn't have enough time with them or perhaps others had made me form an opinion that wasn't real because I didn't take the time myself. And those were the people that helped me through. And I remember that was 2008. And all the way through 12 years later, that same core group of people was still with me in a lot of really critical roles and operations, not for celebrity as we continued to grow, bring in new ships and create new experiences. And I will, what I will say is that I probably learned more as a leader during that time than any other time in my career of leadership. But I also probably gained more respect during that time than I'd ever gained in any other time in my leadership because I didn't leave. I didn't leave them holding the bag to fix it. I didn't walk away and make them face the music. I stood there and I stood up and said, this is me. This is on me. I need your help to fix it. And I'm not going anywhere. And uh, I think that, you know, you got to leave from the front in that regard. And that's why so many people walk through a fire for you when it's needed. You know, I don't know any industry that might have been more and every industry was impacted. But but the cruise line in the pandemic was crazy. I can't imagine being in your position. And, you know, I, I really want to hear this. I, I actually wish I was talked to you, you know, a few months ago because I just finished my new book that's coming out in June. And it's ah. it's the employee experience revolution. It's leadership and all the things you do so well. But in there, I talk about, you know, leading through a crisis and you know, whether it's a pandemic or recession or our own personal company crisis. One of my favorite quotes is tough times build character. I like it when it said tough times reveals it. Right. And, and, and yeah. like that. so how did you do it? And, and what would be the recipe you would tell others when they face their professional personal crisis that you'd go to or you went to? Oh, my goodness. What a time. Yeah. So I will, um, I open the book, chapter one is sort of COVID hitting. And it was so surreal for me when that happened, because it was March of 2020. And I was experiencing the highest of highs in my career. It was International Women's Day week, and I was on Celebrity Edge, and we had 100% of the bridge manned by women. It was a history making barrier breaking cruise. That was brand new at the time, correct? Yeah, it was, uh, she was about a little over a year old, yeah, won all yeah. kinds of awards. Captain Kate was the captain. She had an all-female crew. Every officer on board that was leading all of the different divisions of the ship were women. It was a monumental event. We had just brought the ship out to rave reviews better than we had even hoped or thought. Malala Yousafzai was the godmother. I was standing in the Grand Plaza and all the guests were celebrating International Women's Day. Captain Kate was pouring martinis, standing on the bar. Associate hotel director was playing the, the electric guitar. I think she was playing Led Zeppelin, Van Halen, Lenny Kravitz. Can't remember which, but I just remember thinking these women are so damn cool and these guests are having such a great time. And I remember thinking this is a, my mic drop moment. You know, yeah. this, I, could, I could drop the mic right now. And honestly, I delivered the most innovative sh series of ships and the Relax Luxury brand. I had done so much to improve celebrity, done so much for gender equality. The brand was doing financially better than it had ever done in its history or anybody ever thought it could. I'm like, okay, this is my mic drop moment. Yeah. I got off the ship the next day. I flew home. It was a Wednesday. I went into the office Thursday on Friday. We shut down on Sunday for 15 months. So probably within 72 or 96 hours, I went from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows in my career. And leading through COVID was another experience I will never forget. I went from hard driving, ambitious, results focused, numbers, financial performance. What are we doing today? How are we going to improve our business today to there is no business to improve? And 20,000 people are without work. And we don't know when we're coming back. And hell, we can't even get our crew and our guests home right now. And we have to lay up 15 ships 
And we have to find a way to stay afloat and borrow billions of dollars to do it until we know we can finally come back. And I just remember thinking, I've got a choice. You know, I can wallow in this misery and watch my team get less hopeful, less optimistic, their confidence wane. Or I could do what Winston Churchill said and never let a good crisis go to waste. Mm -hmm. And I, I decided to channel the team's energy in a positive way and to look at this pause as an opportunity and a silver lining to say, when do you ever get a chance to just take a breath and say, how are we going to re-strategize? How are we going to reinvent? How are we going to reimagine? And how are we going to come out stronger than when we left and went out of business? And that's what I did. And I could tell when I pivoted myself, my own thinking and my team's thinking, everyone's attitude changed. Everybody was energized, motivated. They believed again. Well, they're looking at you, right? And if you're panicked, they're yeah. going to panic. Yeah. And if you act like, you know, this is this is where we're supposed to be. I expected this and, you know, we're in the you, you can't be in a better place, which is I know how you were. It made them feel calm, even though you probably had to you know, felt like you were lying to yourself sometimes to get. Yeah, through. I was yeah. absolutely. I had no idea. I'm like, shit. I don't even know if we're going to become a right. Vaccine. No, the fetal you know? position looks really attractive yeah. in those yeah. moments. Yeah, bed. I need to get back into my bed instead <laughs> of on this Zoom camera. Yeah, it's like you think in March you're going to open up in June, and then you think you're coming in December, and then Q1, and all these times just come and go. And I'm like, oh my god. But you fake it till you make it, you know. And I just knew that they needed me to be strong and confident. But I think your lessons in the book are so important because we're, we're all going to face them. And, and like you, I do my best when I'm the underdog and I have a chip on my shoulder and, you know, someone says I can't do it. The moment like you had, the moment I think I arrived and I earned this, maybe I, I, I'm lucky I'll get a couple standing ovations in a row or a bu book will make a bestseller. And I think I've arrived is guaranteed the next day I'm going to get the wind knocked out of me. I'm yeah. going to be humbled, you know? Yeah. So like I try not even let my brain go there because exactly what, what you said. Right. And, it, and you got to do that because you just never know from one day to the next. Yeah. Yeah. If you enjoy what you're learning on the customer service revolution podcast, you'll love our weekly newsletter, the e-service. It's full of great customer experience tips and stories includes special offers, webinars, and more each week. To sign up, head to tdg.click forward slash e-service. That's tdg.click, C-L-I-C-K forward slash e-service, E-S-E-R-V-I-C-E. -E. Enter your preferred email address, and you can look forward to great advice from John in your inbox every Wednesday. You talk a lot about never letting the word no dictate your destiny. Share with our listeners what, what you mean there. Well, first of all, I was in sales for most of my career. And as a salesperson, we all hear no a lot, right? And you just have to take a step back, take a deep breath and say, how am I going to turn this no into a yes? There's got to be something that this person needs that I can provide that will make them change their mind. Yeah. And I remember in my career, I've had a lot of no's. I was uh, even for my first role as the door to door salesperson, they didn't pick me. They picked someone else for the job. I was the second choice. And the person didn't even make it through their probationary period. And they didn't even call me back. And I found out by accident that the person they hired instead of me didn't make it. And I'm thinking, why wouldn't you call me back if I was the second choice? You know, call me and say, hey, you didn't work out. Would you like the job? No, they didn't. I had to start all over again. And then I was moved out of sales and into marketing when the only thing I wanted to do was be the head of sales. And this person who believed in me and put me into marketing, all I thought they were doing was, you know, shoving me aside and my dreams were never going to come true. And so that derailed me and I had to pick myself up and, you know, dust myself off and keep going. I asked for my president and CEO role three times before I got it. And so I just was determined throughout. I'm just determined, you know, I, I 
in, in my marriage, when I say to my husband, hey, we should do this. And he's like, oh, no, we can't do that. And I'm like, think to myself, oh, yes, we are. And I'm going to figure <laughs> out how to do it. But whether we're, And then he's always telling me you were right. Uh, yeah, so that's always good to hear. But yeah, so when someone tells me, no, we can't do it, and I really am focused on it and want it, there's nothing I will let stop me. And what I've learned over time is the easiest answer someone can give us is no. And that's usually why they do it because it's easy. Yeah. Saying yes means you have to put forward a whole different level of energy. And most people are lazy about it. I say in business, I know you share this because a, a, a celebrity is when we say it no to a customer, right? I say that's Latin for I'm lazy and I'm not. I'm not, I'm not going to work hard to help you figure this out. It's exactly. on you. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes. John, can we move this car call to three? No. No. So now it's back on you to say four, when does it work versus saying, well, three is not an option. Here's what I do have. Right. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, and, yeah. and I, I had someone that worked with me once that said, the answer is yes. Now what's the question? Yeah. 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 And that's how I am. You know, I'm a relentless optimist. That's how I've been described. And I don't believe that no is okay. And I'm going to work really hard to change the answer. And that's just what I do. That's who I am. Yeah. And it, it, it ties great into your, the failure, you know, and, and not it, your failure never being final or no, never being, being the final answer. You know, you, you've always had a great philosophy of putting others first. And, you know, I sit, saw it as, as a way, you know, obviously the, the customer experience, but something else that I really witnessed firsthand is how you built great leaders around you. And I think this is really important for, for leaders listening is, you know, how important is that? And you, you've referenced in so many times the people you surround yourself. But even, you know, in any business, many times the person you're helping, the leader you're helping grow may outgrow, you know, your own business and not be with you in a couple of years. But that's part of, you know, your strength and putting other leaders out there in different companies. So, you know, I know some people are afraid uh, to do that, you know, because because they'll lose them. So, so that was a lot of, in there. But but I know I know you know what I meant. <laughs> no, I do know. I do know what you're saying. And I was like, I always wanted others to do well and to be appreciated for what they do. And sometimes that's within your organization and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's within your own company and sometimes it's not. But the most important thing we can do for anyone is what people did for me is recognize talent and help them grow and achieve their dreams and aspirations. And I've realized over time that whatever areas that I can control, that might not be possible. So why should I hold someone back? It was always a loss for me personally and professionally for the brand because they were so good at what they did. And for me, because I cared so much about them, I helped develop them. I nurture people because that's just what I do. I'm, I'm a nurturer. But at the end of the day, I want them to accomplish everything they want and I want them to be appreciated. And sometimes that means letting them go. And I have done that numerous times. I've also seen leaders resent when someone leaves to go do something different. And I think, why would you resent that person? Why would you hold that person back? Yeah. You know, this is their life and this is, these are their opportunities. And I think that's a very selfish way to lead. Yeah. Yeah. No. And that's what I love about you grew so many great leaders. And listen, you know, regardless of if they were, you know, stayed with you two years or, or 10, they benefited you. They benefited you because you made them better and and you relied on them and, and they they were willing to walk through a fire for you. You know, Lisa, this is something that just came on my mind and, and I want to make sure I ask it right. You know, I was thinking here because I know your family's always been important to you. Is it possible for a woman to have a balanced life and achieve, you know, the heights. But as I'm saying it or thinking it is like, well, you know, that same could be said for a man, right? Even though we pigeonhole that it's the woman. I mean, I've struggled with it my whole life of trying to be, you know, the first title is, is a father. And then the second title is, you know, uh, you know, hopefully a successful CEO. So, you know, while I feel guilty about putting that, it is still, you know, unusual. So how did you do it? The reality is, is there's a greater expectation on the things that women need are expected and just take on just because of roles in our lives and 
who we are and the things that we take on, the responsibilities that we take on, especially related to family. And I talk only once about balance in the book because I describe it as perfectly imbalanced. And I believe on any given day, your life is out of balance and your priorities change because of how they need to. Right. The way I look at your life or your role or your title, mother, father, CEO, sister, brother, is that at the end, if you can look back and say you did the best you could and sometimes your family was first and sometimes your job had to be first, as long as it evens out, then that perfect imbalance is okay. But I do think that, especially now, I think things are changing. I think COVID had a lot to do with this as well, where people are reprioritizing what's important to them. Yeah, And I think, again, if you look at silver linings and really awful things, I think that's one of the things of COVID is that we're reevaluating because we almost lost everything and we were separated from the people we loved for so long. My sister was diagnosed with terminal cancer a month after we shut down. It all happened at once. And my sisters mean everything to me, everything. And I remember dealing with being shut down like the worst professional thing that happened in my life. The worst personal thing that happened in my life at the same time. The only silver lining in that horribly dark cloud of losing my sister was that she lived with me and I got to spend every day of her last year of life with her. And you wouldn't have been able to, you wouldn't have been able no, to, right? No, right. no, I would have gone to work every day, I'd be traveling all over the world. And then I would have missed that last year that I had with her. And even during that time, while she was fighting her battle in another room, I was virtually launching Celebrity Beyond three days before she passed. And I remember thinking, I've got to put on this whole motivated, excited persona and launch the ship because it was so important to my team and our brand. And yet right after I shut that camera off, I ran into the other room because she was my priority because I knew it was the end. And um, and I think that was probably the hardest thing of balancing, right, that I can remember. And that's in a very extreme case of it. But I know a lot of families struggle with that. Yeah, no, no. I love the vulnerability you share in your book about that. I mean, you know, I think, you know, that's that's a key leadership trait that we show our vulnerability and employees realize we're human beings and, you know, we struggle as well. Right. And, you know, it's again, if you have this team that has your back and they know, just like I had people's back when I knew they were going through something personal, you know, people have their lives as well as their jobs. And I want people to be happy in their lives. I want people to have balance in their lives. And they gave me the opportunity to do what I needed to do. And they covered for me and they, you know, took on things for me, knowing that I needed to be somewhere else. And again, that symbiotic reciprocal relationship that I think is so important for leaders. Yeah. Lisa, what is the next chapter? Oh, goodness. I have so many things to talk about, John. I hope you invite me back. Yes. So I, uh, I'm i leaving the company in a couple of months at the end of April after 39 years. It's been an amazingly wonderful career. But based on some of the things we just talked about, getting through COVID, losing my sister, building the brand back from ground zero, starting all those ships up again, I knew it was the right time. Celebrity was back. All the ships were in operation. The ships were full. It was wonderful. And I decided, you know, it's time for my next chapter, literally and figuratively. I'm certainly the right age to have, you know, decided to exit stage left from that career. And now I've got a few fun things that I'm going to do as I enter my next chapter. And I'm pretty excited about it. And Follow me on social media because you'll be finding out in a couple of months the things I'll be doing next. Good. And uh, this is really, I don't know, but I would uh, suspect speaking and, you know, about your book and and everything that you, you know, shared here and, and you developed would be so vital for people. But yeah, love to. And so I'm going to have, where should our listeners go to buy the book? I'm going to put it in the show notes and and everything. Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, any local bookstore, anywhere books are sold. If they want to buy for their teams or big groups of people, they can certainly go to Porchlight.com for a bulk purchase. 
I mean, I have all those uh, links in here, as well as uh, ways to follow you, you know, on social media. And we're li- we're talking to Lisa, Lisa Ludolf Perlo, about her new book, Making Waves, A Woman's Rise to the Top Using Smarts, Heart, and Courage, has just come out and is already a bestseller. You, uh, the link will be here. Go buy it. Uh, a few more questions, Lisa. How are you dealing with the New England Patriots? Oh, well, I haven't been dealing with the New England Patriots since they let my boy Tom Brady go. Okay. So you jumped on on uh, Tampa's bandwagon. Yes. Uh, my yeah. sisters okay. and I, we affectionately called ourselves the Tommy Trio. Yeah. We followed Tommy. We were celebrating when he won his Super yes. Bowl first year. Yes. I'm devastated. He retired. I can't wait to watch him calling games yes. next season. And uh, yes, so the Patriots are in a little bit of a mess, but they let the goat go, baby. That's what you get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew, I knew you're a huge Tom Brady and Patriots fan. All right, and last, what's the what's what's your recommendation for for uh, all our listeners to do tomorrow, today, to start making waves in our career and in our life? Courage, courage. Take risks. My subtitle is "A Woman's Rise to the Top Using Smart, Heart, and Courage." And if I had to pick one of the three that I think is the most important, it's courage. I love Leaders that. Leaders need courage, and uh, everything that we do takes courage from the smallest to the biggest decisions, including stepping away from a career after 39 years. That took a lot of courage. Yeah. 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 So I have a, uh, and I always got to make it about me, Lisa. I'm sorry. Um, I have, (laughs) I have, uh, I do a word of the year. I don't know if you you do this, you know, and so I advertise. And one of my favorite words of the year that I wrote about in the uh, relationship economy where I featured celebrity and all the amazing stuff that you guys did was the word encourage. And, uh, you know, encourage is a good word. It's, you know, there's a lot of great words, but I I was reading something uh, when I was doing the research for the book and it said the Greek translation for encourage to make others strong. And I don't know why I had this epiphany and I'm looking at it in courage, right? I separate in courage and then I reverse it to put courage in, right? And and I'm like, as a leader, as a parent, as a human being, that's our job to put so much courage into someone else that they, it's kind of our theme of our conversation today, that they do things they never thought possible. So I love the I love the the connection with courage. I, I think that's that's so important for us to give back and and help people feel that they can do the, the things that we've done. As the end of chapter ten, full steam ahead of my is my final chapter, but it's all about at the very end of the book. It's all about courage and all the courage that you need if you're going to go on this leadership journey. Well, I am so happy for you. I'm so happy you wrote this book. It is so important for anyone starting off entry level position or leader to read this because, you know, I got to see it. Working with you was one of the best projects I was a part because you you talked it, you you know, you drew a line in the sand. You said, this is who we're going to be. And you you did everything you had to. Um, it wasn't flavor of the month, program of the year or management by bestseller. And so I got to see what you're talking about firsthand, the respect your uh, fellow leaders and, and employees had for you and what you did for them when they needed you to be there. So Lisa, I'm so happy and thank you for being on the podcast. Cass and, and, and what you're giving back to so many people. Thank you, John. It's been an absolute pleasure, my friend. All right, revolutionaries, we'll be right back after this. Hi, this is Denise Thompson, managing partner of the DeJulius Group. We know it can be difficult getting the whole team as excited as you are about customer experience. You talk to them, write newsletters, and it seems to go in one ear and out the other. Sometimes it's the message. Sometimes it's the messenger. Sometimes it's just a tough crowd. Consider bringing John in to speak live at your next company or association event. He'll have them laughing, crying, cheering, and most importantly, understanding how to become world-class. Visit johndejulius.com for details or to book your date now. Wrap up this episode with my mantra of living an extraordinary life so countless others do. I heard an amazing quote during a presentation actually to Alcon that one of the attendees said during our workshop, and it went something like this. Uh, It's kind of a gratitude rule. Um, Think it and then say it. Think it, say it. I love that. 
I absolutely love that. Think it, say it. And that's something I struggle with. Uh, not the thinking part. Uh, the thinking part is easy for me. I am so grateful. I'm so blown away by what my kids do, but what, by my, what my employees do, uh, by what my leadership uh, team does, uh, my friend, my friends, and and how they're amazing they are. And and uh, but I rarely tell it and say it to them. And I don't know what is up with that, um, you know. And so I'm trying to make a, a, a habit of doing exactly that. If I think it, say it. Okay. And, and, you know, recognize, 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 uh, and then recognize some more. Did you know that 63% of employees who are recognized regularly said they wouldn't consider looking for a new job and our loved ones and coworkers are not telepathic about our appreciation. You have to be continually expressing your gratitude and appreciation. I love this quote. Feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. So this is something I'm intentionally doing. Uh, this is uh, probably more uh, talking about this uh, on this episode is probably more for me uh, than it is for uh, for for you, our list, my listeners. But uh, something I have on my phone that pops up every night uh, before I go to bed is at bed is gratitude text, and 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 so what I try to do is pause and scroll through my text, uh, which is you know probably the most commonly people I'm communicating with, friends and family. And, and try to hit uh, some people with 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 uh, gratitude texts, uh, things uh, that I'm grateful for, and then uh, same thing with my employees. Uh, don't, you know, don't do a lot, even if it's two or three a night, um, that I'm just reaching out to people and specifically telling them uh, how lucky I am. Thank you, revolutionaries, for joining another episode of the Customer Service Revolution Podcast. 